So with that, we will uh, get this presentation underway. I am so happy to um, be here with you all today. My name is Thad Copeland. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Sustainability. And this is part of our uh, series, Meet the Experts. For each month, we have a time to hear from someone working in a different sector of sustainability. Um, today, we happen to be joined by um, a colleague and friend and partner from the Office of Food and Nutrition Services, a um, sister office at the DOE. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get that set up, but uh, we're here today with Stephen O'Brien. And um, I just want to say before Stephen takes over and turn the mic, off, mic over to him that um, we in the Office of Sustainability filled a lot of questions across all sectors, and I, I think up there the top three, it's always waste, it's food, and it's energy, and these are the three questions we get the most about, so we're really honored and pleased to have Stephen here today to answer and help explain some of these connections of uh, food to sustainability, but also some of the ways that we are working together. Um, I know it's going to be enlightening, so with that, I will turn it over to Stephen, who's the Director of Strategic Partnerships, um, and Stephen, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, Thad. I uh, appreciate the kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's an exciting topic to, to talk about. Obviously, it's my life passion. I've been working with the Department of Education for 30 years and really passionate about the work that we do. Um, the first thing I need to do is send a huge extended thank you to all of our frontline workers. Um, our food service team has been providing service to students since the first day that schools closed in New York City. Um, so basically since uh, last March, uh, the day after the mayor closed the city down and schools were converted to remote service, we started to feed the community immediately the next day. And we have continued to do that every weekday um, and many holidays uh, since last March. So we're coming up on a year of feeding all New Yorkers, um, not only our students, um, so that we can make sure that all New Yorkers have the um, energy and the security to know that there is food available in all of our neighborhoods across the city. And so, you know, a really big thank you to the 9,000 employees that work for school food service um, in, our, in our approximately 1,800 schools. As we jump into this presentation, yes. sorry, can you hear me, Dad? Sorry, so I was just going to say, yes, yes, perfect. I just wanted to uh, say two things. I'm sorry to interject. One is, how huge that is that you just shared, and I don't want to diminish that. That's an incredible feat, and that's filled such an important need in our city during this historic time. So thank you for saying that up front. Um, I also wanted to say, I in the intro, I accidentally skipped over um, a logistics slide. So if you have a question for Stephen, which I'm sure you will, um, put them in the Q&A. Uh, we have a button that says Q&A. Use that to put the question. The chat feature is also enabled. We prefer that to be more of if you have uh, just something that you want to share, like a, not, not necessarily a question, but you want to ask, uh, share, or express a thought, use the chat feature for that. But anything that's in the Q&A will be monitored at the end of this session when Stephen concludes. Uh, we'll have time, uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, uh, for him to address those questions. So please uh, use that feature. Sorry, Stephen. That's OK, Dad, no problem. Um, Maybe as we get started and I'm doing my introduction to the presentation, you could jump in with our first survey question, which is, um, I would love to have, some, have the group uh, just do a quick survey, a poll using the Zoom poll on um, what descriptive word best describes yourself, um, just so we get a little sense of who's here. So as we're, as we're talking about this presentation, again, I wanted to say a huge thank you we're serving approximately 400,000 meals a day to our community. Um, that's students and community members. Uh, we have students picking up service during Monday through Fridays during the school day. We have about um, 300 sites that are open to the community to pick up meals in the evenings. And as I said before, we're very proud of the fact that we're doing our part to make sure that our communities are food secure. Um, when, we're, when we're thinking about the food service program in schools, um, this presentation is primarily going to be focused on the discussion around what it looks like during a normal school year. So I'm not really speaking from the lens of the pandemic service, but more about 
what we hope to see a return to normal service come the fall. Uh, we are really excited that we just welcomed our high school students back this week. Um, for those that decided to do um, a blended program where they're coming into the school to receive instruction. And at this point, all grade levels are back in school if they so choose to be back in school. And we're hopeful that we'll have an expanded summer program this summer and we'll be opening up schools come the fall. All of that is still to be determined. There's still too many variables in the community for us to make a final decision. But as um, the food service program, we're really excited to uh, get ready to welcome students back into the dining rooms and on our serving lines. Um, great, thank you for sharing the poll. So we have about 50% of the group today are students, which is awesome. Uh, we're here to serve you and uh, some administration teachers, a nice cross section of folks. Thanks for doing that. Zach. Yeah, I wanted to say too, about 75% of the participants voted. So this is really the whole body, but it's the majority. Yeah, that's fantastic. Great. Um, so let me move into the next slide. This presentation is really going to uh, give an overview of sort of many different areas and trying to just give everybody sort of an introduction to how complex it is to deliver food service to 1.1 million students in the largest school district in the country. Um, it's not all that different from if you stop and think, when you start to make lunch today, there was a lot that went into making that lunch. You had to, first of all, think about your grocery list, go buy your groceries, get those groceries into your kitchen, store those groceries, and then you needed to think about what was available for you to make the menu for today's lunch. You had to make your lunch. You then had to consume the lunch. Hopefully you enjoyed what you made. Sometimes even when you make your own food, you don't always enjoy it. Um, and then you have to decide, am I gonna have that same recipe again the next time I make lunch? So even when you think about your own food experience in a very personal way, when you magnify that to a large system, it's just as complex with just as many moving parts. Um, today's presentation, I mean, food really matters because it sustains life, but it's also a powerful tool that brings people together. It impacts your long-term health, it impacts the environment, and the economies in your area. Food does have the power to be an equalizer. Um, in New York City, we're really proud that we have free meals for all, so everybody can get a free meal for breakfast and lunch or after school. Um, and while we're happy that we have free access to the food, um, we do strive to make sure that we deliver food in a more equitable way. You know, are we making sure that everybody has the same quality food in all of our schools? Um, we want to make sure that students have access to the meal, but they should also have access to food that has minimal ingredients in their food. They should have access to the opportunity to compost, compost organic waste, and they should have the opportunity to choose local foods that support local farmers. Um, for example, when you're going through the serving line and you choose an apple, our apples are from New York State, which is really a fantastic thing because we're basically the third largest apple producing state in the country. So as we go through the presentation, just keep thinking about how sort of these three bubbles intersect. When you look at this Venn diagram, they do overlap. And at different points, one takes more of a priority over the other as we think about policy and we think about our programs as a whole. Next slide. So the next part of the presentation is gonna be really about who we are. You know, who is the Office of Food and Nutrition Services? Even in the name, it's important that we're thinking about, um, it's important that we think about the fact that in the name, we're talking about food, we're talking about nutrition, and we're talking about service. Many of our frontline employees are from the community. They know the students' names. They greet you with a smile. They welcome you to the serving line. Um, you know, it's a really important aspect of the day. As a student that was bullied when I was in elementary school and middle school and most of my high school career, when I went to the serving line and I saw the serving lady every day in high school and she greeted me and welcomed me to lunch and just said, hey, how you doing, Stephen? Um, you know, and greeted me with a smile. That was a huge sense of stability in a very chaotic day. And so even those small interactions really matter, and that's why it's important that we really recognize the service that we're providing each day. We are a big program. Um, we have 30 plus menus that we run. We have menus that are fully vegetarian for schools that decide they want to do a full vegetarian menu. We have um, menus 
as far as different menus for different age groups. So the elementary school menu is different from a high school menu. We have breakfast menus, lunch menus, after school snack menus, after school supper menus, weekend snack menus, weekend supper menus. Um, there's a lot of different moving parts when we think about the menus that we provide to our, to our schools. In addition, um, we support those menus with over 300 recipes. You know, recipes are being developed all the time. We have hundreds of chefs, trained chefs that are working with us that are developing the recipes that go into our menus. This goes to about 1,800 schools. About 1,400 of those have kitchens. The other schools, we're satelliting food from a nearby kitchen to that school. We're servicing 1.1 million students, about 960,000 meals daily. Um, and about 170,000, uh, sorry, 170 million meals on an annual basis. We are the largest program in the country, and many people say we're second to the U.S. military in public food service. Again, this is during a typical year, not during the pandemic. Move into the next slide. So let me just do a quick poll um, asking a survey. How many of you have met your cook in charge at your school? It's going to take a minute for that to pop that up. Should be up now. Yep. Thank you. All right. At Fifty percent voting. I'll let it, let it go a little bit longer. Great. Thank you, Pat. So. As we're waiting for the poll to come in, if you see this slide in front of you, you'll see that we have sort of a structure of how we're set up. This is important for me to share with you as students, as administrators, as people that are working in the schools, because I think it's important to understand that we have great employees that are our kitchen helpers. So there's men and women that do things like prepare the salads, make the sandwiches, wash the fruit, receive the deliveries, clean the kitchens. Great, so we have a little bit of a 50-50 here. I'll come back to that in a minute. Thank you. Um, so we have great helpers that are helping to do the, the day in and day out of really the service of the food, um, receiving the food, et cetera. Each of those kitchens is run by a cook in charge. So there's one cook in charge of each kitchen throughout the city. That cook is supervised by a manager. The managers have three to five kitchens. So they'll have three to five schools in a neighborhood that they're helping to support. And the manager is the one that really makes the work schedules, orders the food, et cetera. They're overseen by a district supervisor. So maybe you realize that in New York City, we have uh, about 32 school districts. Each of those school districts has a district supervisor that oversees the kitchen in that geographic district. That district supervisor has a regional director that oversees the operations pretty much by a borough level. So you have a regional director for Manhattan, a regional director for um, the Bronx, a regional director for Queens, and then you have a regional director for half of Brooklyn, and then the other half of Brooklyn and Staten Island are region. So you have five regional directors that are overseeing the operations, and they report up to a director of operations in our central office, which is located in Long Island City, Queens. Um, it's really important that as you're working in the schools, or if you're a student in the schools, to really seek out and get to know who is the cook in charge of that kitchen? Um, that's the person that day in and day out is making sure that the food is prepared on time as per the menu. They're trying to minimize waste. They're trying to work with their staff to make sure that they're serving you with a smile. So they're really the, the best person to get to know so that if there's sort of day-to-day -day issues, that cook in charge can assist you. It's also important to get to know the manager because the manager is also responsible for the overall operation in this cluster of schools that they see. So again, I encourage you if you haven't, about 50% of you said you have not, met your cook in charge to meet your cook in charge. Say thank you to our staff. Get to know our staff because they're the ones on the front lines that can really help make a difference if you're interested in changing some of the food environment in your school. Next slide. Next, I just want to dump, jump into a little bit about nutrition. Quick poll here. How many of you think the Office of Food and Nutrition Services serves healthy food? Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Just pop up the poll when you get a chance. Um, I think there it is. Sorry. It was hiding. 
<laughs> no problem. How many of you think that we serve healthy food at the Office of Food and Nutrition Services? And please be honest, because it's anonymous. That's great. Thank you, Ted, for running the polls. Sure. I'm going to leave it open for 10 more seconds. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, survey says. <laughs> wow, that's really encouraging to see. So, you know, part of the reason I asked this is that perception is reality in a lot of ways. So, you may think that we're serving food that is sort of fast food in style. You're seeing pizza and you're seeing burgers and you're seeing sandwiches. And sometimes people don't think that that's healthy food, but we're really doing an excellent job behind the scenes to make sure that our food is as healthy as possible. Um, this slide exemplifies how we think about building a recipe and building our menus. We have to make sure that number one, it's food, that you're going to enjoy it, that you're going to eat it. So acceptability comes in number one. As a chef, I want to make sure that you're enjoying the food because if you're not enjoying the food, then why am I creating that recipe and serving it to you? The nutrition standards are super important because we are serving growing adults. So as children, your, your body is in need of a variety of nutrients in order to develop well and to develop into a strong adult without long-term health um, problems. So as a result, the federal government comes up with nutrition standards that we need to um, have in place when we are building our menus. So we have to think about the um, various things like calories and nutrients, et cetera. But we also have New York City standards. New York City is a leader in trying to reduce sodium, to encourage more whole grains, to get away from um, high calorie beverages. So all of those initiatives have to be considered when we're building our menus. And, and so it's not just about how good does this taste, but how good is it for you? And then we are a program that is primarily funded by the federal government. So for every meal that we serve, we get a small amount of money back in order to cover the costs associated with making that meal. So we get about um, uh, $3.60 or so for every lunch that we serve. And out of that $3.60, about $1.60 goes to just the food. I don't know about you, but if, if you go to the corner bodega, when I go to the Bronx and I'm in the corner bodega and I decide I want to buy a pack of gum, pack of gum is going to be about a dollar, dollar thirty, um, or even more, depending on what kind of gum you get. Some people call it Gucci gum if you're getting the fancy gum. So <laughs> when you think about a pack of gum and you think about, wow, I'm spending a dollar twenty or a dollar fifty on a pack of gum, here we are trying to make an entire lunch for what many people are buying a pack of gum for. And it's an extremely challenging situation, but at the same time, we are able to do great work because of our scale. You know, as we talked about before, we're so big. So we do a good job of buying a lot of lettuce, a lot of tomatoes, a lot of meat, a lot of um, fruits. And when you buy things at that much volume, you usually get a very good price. But we pay a lot of money to have food delivered in New York City. So just like everything, when you try to move things around in New York, it's quite expensive. So delivery costs are very high. So when you think about that $3.60, it goes pretty quick because about half of it goes to the food, but the rest has to go to the salaries, to moving the food, to the logistics, to paper goods that we serve the food on. So the money does go quite fast. Um, you know, you may be surprised to realize that many non-public schools, many private schools, many colleges, universities, others that do similar type of lunch service, we'll see something along the lines of three to five dollars in food costs, not a dollar sixty. So we work really hard on policy to try to get the federal government to give us more money for better food and better compostable products, et cetera. But it is restricted by the costs that we can plan, that we can plan for based on the way we develop our menus. So once again, we're making sure our menus are acceptable, that the food tastes good, that it meets the nutrient standards, and that it falls within reasonable cost guidelines. Next slide. Here's a little snapshot of sort of the things we have to think about when it comes to nutrients. We have to think about the calories and the sodium or salt that's in the food. We have to think about total fat and saturated fat and trans fats, all different types of fats, because 
We want to make sure that we're only consuming healthy fats. We want to make sure we're not uh, eating or drinking too much sugar. So are we getting our sugar from a natural source like a fresh apple or from milk? Or are we adding sugar to it when we talk about things like, um, you know, a cereal? Are we adding sugar to the cereal and how much sugar are we adding? Or yogurt. If we're adding yogurt, making yogurt, we're adding sugar to the yogurt, but we try to make sure we add only a small amount of sugar. And then fiber to make sure that we're getting plenty of fiber to keep our um, heart healthy and to keep our bodies in, in good shape and balanced. Next slide. We prohibit a lot of ingredients. So you may see that people talk about, oh, you know, that fancy food at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, that's so good and it's supposed to be really great food, but it costs more money than what it costs at my, um, you know, my key food that might be in my neighborhood or my local supermarket, my Western beef, whatever the case may be. Um, it's really important to know that for school food, we make sure and we have made sure since the 1960s for a very long time that our ingredients are very clean. In other words, we don't put artificial ingredients into our food. We don't put artificial colors. We don't put artificial flavors. We don't put, um, we don't bleach the flour. We do a lot of things to make sure the ingredients are as pure as they possibly can be. So on our website, you can find the list of all of our prohibited ingredients. But when you think about the prohibited ingredients, they also have, as we were talking about in that first diagram I showed you, they also have an impact on sustainability. So we don't allow for palm oil to be in any of our foods because of the high fat content that's associated with palm oil. But at the same time, palm oil is one of the um, most detrimental food ingredients that we have out there. It's known to create huge deforestation problems in the Amazon and other areas of Southeast Asia. And as a result, by us banning that ingredient, we're also making sure that we're doing our part to reduce deforestation as it occurs throughout the world. So even though it might not make a, a clear directional um, that when you think about nutrition or you think about the ingredients, might not always have an obvious impact on sustainability, obvious impact on economics, but it certainly does. You know, by us not having palm oil, we're not, you know, um, we're not getting an ingredient that might not be a fair trade ingredient. And also we, we're getting an ingredient, we're not getting an ingredient that's contributing to harming the earth. Next slide. So sustainability, it's kind of a good segue into how do we contribute to a healthy planet at the Office of Food and Nutrition Services? Next slide. So there's some pretty large buckets, but as we go through the presentation, you'll, you'll hear some additional items. But we do um, have compostable or recyclable disposable items. So we basically have removed single use items and we allow for, if there is a single use item, it's going to end up in the recycling stream or the compostable stream. So for example, um, you'll see in a minute on some of the presentations that we have compostable plates and we have compostable utensils and bowls and things like that. We also do sustainable menu planning. So right now in the pandemic, we very proudly um, have been serving uh, salads as grab and go items. We're serving a meatless Monday every Monday. And going into next fall, this is hot off the presses, um, we're, pro we're going to be moving to two days a week that's going to be a vegetarian menu. We're gonna have a Monday and a Friday as a vegetarian menu. This is really the future that a more plant-based forward approach to the way that we eat and we menu plan um, really has amazing impacts on helping for a more sustainable environment, but it also has amazing outcomes on nutrition. Economics are about flat, except that when you think about a more plant-based diet, you usually end up ordering more local products, which are then going to stimulate local economies, like our farmers in New York State will see us buying more fruits and vegetables from New York State as a result of us moving towards a more plant-based menu. We also, um, we also, there's a typo here, but it should be thoughtful supply chain. So we are thoughtful in the way that we're buying our food. So for example, the federal government has a program where we can buy food um, through a produce supplier and that produce supplier identifies what states the different food is from. And we do our part to make sure that we're buying as much as we can locally to reduce our carbon footprint on the transport of food. So even when we're thinking about our business, we're thinking about all of these different aspects when we're doing it. And we're working hard to reduce food waste. So I'll explain that in just a minute, but 
reducing food waste is very important because we know that we um, may be over serving food and we don't want to be in a situation where we're wasting the food that we're preparing and serving to our students. Next slide. So compostable plates, a few years ago, we were able to work with a partner called Cafeteria Culture, um, and we started to reduce the frequency of polystyrene trays being used. Then we worked with our national partner, which we're a member of the Urban School Food Alliance, and we got a whole bunch of districts together to buy a compostable plate. Um, and by us all pulling our purchasing power together, all of our student meals together, we were able to bring the price of that compostable plate down from 15 cents a plate to five cents a plate. That was a huge opportunity for us that happened about five years ago. And we're now in the process of going forward with our next contract for compostable plates. Um, and this, so this plate can go right into the compost bin with um, any other organic matter like um, apple cores or leftover chicken bones, whatever the case may be, all of that can go into the compostable bin, which is really great. Next slide. After that contract, we went forward with proceeding to do a compostable utensils contract. And each of these contracts will get better over time. The compostable utensil contract was a huge win as well. We also worked with the Urban School Food Alliance and other school districts to bring the price down. But we had to work really hard at creating a product that actually worked. That when you put the spoon into a hot beverage or into a hot food, it didn't melt or it didn't disform. We needed to make sure that both of these products, the plate and the utensil, did not have PFAs in them, that they weren't contributing to um, problems during the manufacturing process. And we needed to make sure that the product would be acceptable to the Department of Health. So we did have to wrap the item, and the wrapper is not compostable, but neither is the wrapper on a sandwich or the wrapper on um, a fruit product. So anything that's wrapped has to be unwrapped before it can be composted. That includes our utensils. Next, we did testing with a third party organization. You can open up all of those pictures. Testing with a third party um, organization to make sure that, yeah, even though the company told us that the utensil was gonna break down, we needed to prove it. So we had a third party take the utensils, bury them in a, wood, uh, a woodrow pile, do composting, and in 90 days, you see the results of where the product broke down um, more than 90%, which is great. That means that it worked. If it's wrapped, obviously it won't work. And so again, that messaging around making sure that anything's wrapped is unwrapped before we put it in the compost bin is extremely important. Next slide. Okay. Um, so sustainable menu planning, I sort of alluded to this, but again, we have to be thinking about nutrition, but we also have to be thinking about sustainability. So we've done a few things in the last couple of years that are really exciting. We've um, introduced meatless Mondays. We've introduced grab and go salads so that students can take their salad with them. Um, we've introduced a reduced beef frequency. So maybe two years ago, we were serving beef items um, a couple of times a week. Now we're serving them a couple of times a month. Um, we're including vegetarian menu options more and more. We have a vegetarian menu. So we have about six schools that are fully vegetarian and principals can opt in to use that vegetarian menu if they choose to. So we're doing our part to introduce what they call cool, C-O-O-L, foods into the program so that it has less of an impact on the environment when we think about the way food is being grown and sourced. Next slide. So supply chain mindfulness, what I was sort of talking about there with thoughtful supply chain. So we think about this when it comes to the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, the processors who maybe take chicken and cook it or roast it for us, and our distributors. What are distributors doing for the last mile of distribution? They're the guys that distribute the food from the warehouse to the school kitchen. So in those areas, we work really hard with an organization called the Center for Good Food Purchasing. The mayor's office has taken a lead on this, and we are one of the many agencies in the city that really work to evaluate these value categories in all the contracts that we put out. So whether we're putting out a contract to buy food um, from a processor or we're working with a distributor, we're looking at making sure that it has the best nutrition possible, that it's supporting local economies, that it's valuing the workforce that it's making sure that if there were workforce violations where people got injured at work, they're correcting those violations, that they're paying their employees a fair wage, 
Um, we're looking at environmental sustainability. What are they doing to make sure that their organizations are environmentally sound? Have they converted their vehicles to electric vehicles? Have they done things to make sure that um, they're reducing energy in their warehouses and in their facilities? All of these things are making their way into the contracts so that we can make sure we're purchasing good food in our supply chain. And animal welfare, for example, our chicken bid requires certification that they're um, treating the chickens um, following the Poultry Council's animal welfare guidelines. So these types of things are making it front and forward in our, the way that we're purchasing food. Next, we're thinking about making sure that we're buying food from New York State. We need to make sure that we're doing our part as such a large city in New York State and buying food from New York processors. So as I mentioned, we made sure that we were buying, next slide when you get a chance, um, that we're buying New York apples, we're buying milk from New York dairy farmers, that we're buying yogurt from New York State. Um, we buy scallions and other vegetables. Um, and we buy processed food like pretzels and rolls and breads coming from New York State. This is important because we wanna make sure that we're doing our part as New York City to support our neighbors in New York State to make sure that they have jobs and to make sure that our state is vibrant and, and providing an opportunity for farmers and the agricultural and the food service industry to make money um, for our neighbors in the state. Next slide. We're doing school work where uh, gardener cafes are popping up all over the city. Um, we wanna make sure that hyper-local farm to school work is happening. So if you're growing the food, we can serve the food in the kitchen. Um, it doesn't get more local than that. Next. Food waste reduction. So how are we working to reduce food waste in the schools? So um, let's see if we can pull up this, this uh, survey poll. I think we have one or two more before the end of the presentation. Just a few more slides. So which of the following is not a way to reduce food waste? Okay, the poll's open. Yeah. Which of the following is not a way to reduce food waste? Ten more seconds on the polling. Great. And I have about four more minutes, right? Um, Good. Yeah, more or less, but okay. All right, the results are um, great. You got the point. So all of those previous questions, uh, all of those previous selections, batch cooking for each lunch period, making food in time for each lunch period, not cooking everything at 9 a.m. and then hoping that the students come to eat it. Um, monitoring menu selections. We're looking at how many portions of each menu item was taken each day. So when we serve that menu again, we're making sure we don't waste food and over produce um, based on the way that menu was set up. We're rotating stock to make sure that if we see something that's expiring, we're getting ready to make a menu change and serve it, not waste it. But when we serve food that students aren't familiar with, when we introduced hummus as an example, citywide, you know, it takes time for students to get acclimated to tasting something new. And we have to do that because we want to try to introduce new foods. There's always innovation happening in the industry where there's new products being developed. And with that comes an inherent amount of food waste that it's a big deal for a student to go through a serving line and try something new. You only get one lunch. So if you're taking that food item and you only get one lunch and you don't like it, well, that's a pretty big risk when you're hungry and you want food for you to be able to have the energy to learn for the rest of the day. So we understand that when we go to introduce new foods, there's going to be a little uptick in the waste. We try to do food tastings. We try to do education, but it's challenging when we go to introduce new foods to students. So with that, once foods are served, next, next, um, next uh, slide. So one of the things that we do is we try to give students more self-selection. So you see salad bars in schools. What we're doing now is we've been uh, getting grant funding to support what we call CEE sites, which is really the cafeteria, um, cafeteria environment um, enhancement. So what we're doing is this is a before picture of what serving lines might have looked 
prior to the enhancement. Next slide. And this is a picture of what it looks like after the enhancement. So these cost quite a bit of do uh, dollars. So this is like maybe it was anywhere between 500,000 to a million dollars to renovate an environment like this, where you're changing the furniture in the dining room, you're changing the equipment that we're serving the food from. As you can see from this type of service, it's more self-selection. And the opportunity here is that if we're not putting the food on your plate and you're choosing the food yourself, you're gonna see that there's less waste associated with it. And you're also more likely to consume the food that you take. We do this in our high schools. We have about um, 180 high schools that are on point through next year to get this as a whole. We had about 60 schools going last year. We have another 40 or 50 coming this year. And we'll keep moving in this direction in our high schools so that at the high school setting, we can help to make sure that students have more self-selection. Next slide. Offer versus serve. So we offer five different components. When a student goes through the line, we need to offer a meat or a protein of some sort. So it could be a vegetarian item like cheese, or it could be bean-based like a hummus. But we have a protein item. We have a bread item. We have a vegetable, a fruit, and a milk. So those five items have to be offered, but not all of those items have to be taken. So if we can implement offer versus serve better, we see students self-select the items they want. We reduce food waste because we're not putting all five items on the plate. And we're lowering food costs, which is good for the economics. We're not wasting money in the, in the mix. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we have the five components. Um, and there's some items that are two components themselves. So like a sandwich typically will be two components because you have the, um, let's say in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you have the peanut butter, which is the protein, and the bread, which is the grain. Um, pizza is another example of two components. Next slide. Sorry. Pizza is an, another example of two components where you'll have cheese and you'll have the crust. So when you think about the components, it, it, it's important to realize that there may be some items that actually encompass two components at the same time. Just want to make sure we're moving through the slides and we're on the breakfast slide. I think Thad may have had a technical difficulty, so just give us one minute and I can bring up the slides. No worries, thank you, Pat. Yeah. We're on slide 24, which yeah. if you wanted to go back to the one that says food component versus food item. I'm back now too. I guess it was me that went down. I thought it was you, Stephen. Sorry about that. That's okay. Pat's pulling it up. Great. Um, so here at the end of this slide, you'll see what I was talking about with two components. Next slide. So at breakfast, um, we serve three component. We serve four components. Um, so there's usually two grains, like a cereal and a muffin, a fruit and a milk. So for each of these um, meals, next slide. A student needs to take at lunch three out of the five components, and one of those has to be a fruit or a vegetable. Okay. So very simply. You could take a roll, a salad, and a fruit, and that's a reimbursable meal. You don't have to take a milk, and you don't have to take um, roasted chicken that might be offered with it. So I think this is an area where we can really work at a school level, whether you're a student organization, a student club, whether you're an educator, a sustainability coordinator. You can really work with our cook in charge and our team to help make sure that we're not putting all five items on the plate, because sometimes the principals ask us to put all five items on the plate to move students through the line very fast. Um, and you can work to also educate your fellow students to make sure they realize that you don't have to take all of the items. You only have to take three out of the five components, and one of those three has to be a fruit or a vegetable. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving. So. What steps can you take? You can work to make sure that you're reviewing this in your school community. You can let food service staff know that you don't want all the items to be automatically put on the plate. You can ask students, um, you can have students ask for the items they want. So helping to educate the students so that when you go through the line, you actually you know, ask what you would like to have on your plate. Um, you communicate the menu daily and frequently. So you could work with us to make sure that you get a 
uh, a copy of the menu ahead of time and maybe a student during the morning announcements is telling everyone what the menu is for that day. So they have an hour or two before they go to lunch to think about what they're going to take. Um, and we do have share tables where if something isn't eaten, before you throw it into the compost bin or the trash, you can put it on a share table as long as it's a wrapped item and another student could have that as a second portion before it has to be thrown away. Next slide. All of this work we don't do by ourselves. So we rely, um, we've been working really hard over the past couple of years to work closely with our partners. Um, we have about 50 partners that support our work. They help us develop innovations. Like I mentioned earlier, we went from serving on a styrofoam uh, tray to moving to a compostable tray because of partners. It happened at one school on the Lower East Side many years ago. Um, it takes years to make the change, but if you stick with it, you can really turn a big organization like ours to be an example for the rest of the country. Um, we had vegetarian menus. We were the first public school system to serve a fully vegetarian menu to public school students in Queens. That came from one school and from one partner. Um, the enhancement project came from partners who worked together to make sure that they um, instilled in city council and other uh, funders to make sure that we were going to get the funding necessary to change the cafeteria environments because many of our environments are very old and not very welcoming, especially in our high schools. Um, so we break up our partner work uh, into community work. Um, we have interdepartmental partners, as, as Thad mentioned in the very beginning. Uh, we're a partner with the Division of, uh, with Division of School Facilities Office of Sustainability. We're partners with the Parent Engagement Office. We're partners with the Office of School Wellness um, and many others. We're partnered externally with uh, state organizations like the New York State Department of Agriculture and the New York State Department of Education and the New York Farmland Trust. We partner on a national level, as I mentioned, with the Urban School Food Alliance and Share Our Strength and No Kid Hungry and many other national levels. And on a community level, we, we work with um, the uh, Parent Caucus through Community Food Advocates. We work with our um, community education councils to make sure that we're meeting with our uh, community education councils. We're meeting with the community and the PTAs. Um, our supervisors talk to them to make sure that at a local level, the food service is meeting their expectations. All of this works together in a very interrelated way. If we're working together, we can help influence the policies that might give us more funding for better quality food. Or we can influence the policies that talk about um, initiatives like getting more local products on our lunch menu, which may lead to more money in our reimbursements, which may lead to less of an impact on the environment. So as you can see, each of these things are interrelated. And if we don't work with our partners, we can't move all of these things forward simultaneously. If we only worked with one partner on one issue, we would be focusing on a very singular approach to the way that we do our work instead of looking at it like we understand we're part of this bigger system and this bigger system has major impacts on the way that the earth is going to be healthy for the future. Last slide, as we go forward with um, what's in store for us, we have a great partnership with the Lifetime Foundation over the next five years to look at what they call the harmful seven and remove them from our foods. We're reducing antibiotics in our meat items. We do not have any antibiotics in our chicken items, and we just adopted a responsible use of antibiotics for turkey. So when turkey's raised, it's very rarely getting antibiotics during its lifetime. Just like we take antibiotics when we're sick, animals need to take antibiotics to prevent them from dying. But when you're raising animals for food supply, sometimes that can be abused. And what we're doing is making sure that they're not abusing the use of antibiotics, that they're not using them just to use them, they're using them only when it's necessary. Um, so that we reduce the amount that's being used so that when we get sick as humans, our antibiotics continue to work. If antibiotics are overused, then what will happen is people won't respond well when antibiotics are given because the virus will have learned that that antibiotic is gonna come and they find a new way to infect you as a result of you building up resistance. The Center for Good Food Purchasing and Evaluation and Technical Assistance, as I mentioned, we're working with them um, and we continue to do that. We have less processed food, so we've just finished our scratch cooking pilot and now we're moving to take that scratch cooking program and institute it into the citywide menus. 
Um, we're doing more plant forward menus. As I mentioned, we're moving to two days a week as being vegetarian menus. We're enhancing the uh, um, environment in our high schools. And we're really working on policy discussions. In the next year, we're going to see the federal legislation that dictates how we serve food in schools being debated. So students and communities can engage in that debate. We have the farm bill that's going to support programs that um, encourage more fresh fruits and vegetables. Right now, there's bills being introduced at the federal level to reduce plastic use. Um, we're also a part of energy conservation. We turn off our equipment when our kitchens are closed to make sure that we're not just running an empty refrigerator. And we're looking to make sure that municipal priorities are supporting things like our garden and cafe programs and all these local initiatives that are so important to making sure that students have the ability to learn how food is grown and how they can contribute to being good food consumers in the future. That's it. If anyone has right. any questions or wants to reach out, I have a contact slide there, but also, um, you know, I'm sure in the communications that you received leading up to today, um, if anyone needs to contact us, you can reach out through the um, Division of School Facilities Office of Sustainability, or you can contact me directly. Thank you, Stephen. I'm sorry I had a, an issue with my con connectivity mid presentation, no but I think we persevered thanks to Pat and Meredith. Um, yeah, we do have some questions and we have a little bit of time, so I think it'd be great to pitch some of those to you. And also, I'll take this time to segue to Meredith, too. She's our Director of Sustainability. She uh, joined me. I uh, wanted to say hello and welcome to her. Um, but let's look at the Q&A box and see what we have. Um, one is uh, just a question it's from Paula Lucas about your t taste testing, that process. How often are students included in taste testing when new foods are being introduced into the menu and how are they chosen? Great, thank you for that question. Um, all of our food items and our recipes are student driven. So it's not a bunch of chefs or adults or different communities pushing us to put the food on the menus. The students are the ones that are selecting the items for our menus. Um, during a regular school year, obviously with the pandemic, we had limited testing. We did do some student testing when we had in-person instruction at the school level, but typically we have a field trip opportunity. So if schools are interested in uh, conducting a field trip, we pay for the field trip for the students to come to our headquarters office in Long Island City. We have a, a test kitchen and lab where the students will come. They'll learn about the food products that are being tested. We ask the students to test those products. It's typically a group of about 35 students or one class at a time. Um, where they'll come through and we'll make sure that we're serving that item to a few hundred students. Um, and as long as the product has at least a 75% acceptance rate, we'll then move the product forward in the development process and into the menu process. That whole thing takes about a year for us to go from what we conceptualize to actually seeing it on a menu, because once we see that it's a successful item, we need to go through contracting, et cetera, to get the item into our food supply. Um, but it's student driven. Typically in, an, in a year, we'll see anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 students testing food throughout the year. It's basically three days a week, every week during the academic year. That's awesome. Um, related to the student involvement, another person just asked about, is there an opportunity for students to get involved more behind the scenes? So I guess in addition to food testing, are there actual, maybe perhaps internship opportunities or anything else that would involve Great. students with of, yep. OFNS? Yep, so if you um, haven't already, uh, there, I'm just looking on my phone, there is a school food app. So I first encourage people to make sure that they're downloading the um, school food app. Um, it's on Android and Apple. And in the app, we'll push out surveys every once in a while about different products. Uh, so that's one way to get engaged behind the scenes is to be on the app. And as long as you have your student ID, you can be a part of that survey process. The other thing that we do is through the career and technical education high schools, there are uh, 12 culinary programs in the city. Um, so in those 12 high schools, we do sponsor internships for those students uh, where they're actually working in our kitchens and serving their peers, uh, which is really a great way to engage. And through the partnership meetings um, that our managers are having at the school level, we encourage the parent coordinator and others to make sure that if there's an interest at a school level to have a uh, group of students participate in focus groups and conversations with our manager and cook in charge. We're open to that as well. 
So that would be like a small group of students at a school level, right, as opposed exactly. to doing something more central. That's very great. Oh. Um, and then a question about plastic packaging in high schools with um, noticing there's more plastic packaging. Is there any way to still have self-selection? I guess is the referring to the new upgrade in the cafeterias without all of the packaging. That's a great, I, a great point. Um, we are working with the Office of Sustainability and our partners on thinking about how can we reduce um, the way that things are packaged. And obviously we were, I will say, we were very publicly moving towards doing a plastic free lunch day um, right before the pandemic started um, last spring. So we are really trying to think about how can we put the food directly onto the compostable plate and not have things overly wrapped where it doesn't make sense. Sometimes there's Department of Health requirements for us to wrap certain items because they're standing out on certain equipment. Um, sometimes it is a convenience issue. So when you are doing those grab and go stations in the high schools that enhance service, um, the idea there is that it moves the line very quickly because we have everything prepackaged and ready to go. So there are um, sort of a, a benefit analysis that needs to be done on each of these initiatives. But we are working with our partners to think innovative in an innovative way. How can we sort of stop, take a look at the menu that we're serving now, and think about where are there opportunities for us to reduce packaging as we go forward? And I think we're going to see that become a high priority in the next couple of years. As I mentioned, things don't turn instantly. Um, we do need to really sort of study it and make sure that we get the sign off from the Department of Health and others that we can safely serve the food. And then one final question is um, just sort of a future question, but you've talked a lot about things on the horizon with new policies, new opportunities, such as like introducing the uh, twice a week vegetarian meals, but has COVID changed priorities for anything that may be upcoming? And if so, could you give some examples? Great. Well, I think we all need to be hopeful that, you know, the initiatives and sort of the um, work that we have been doing for several years to create a healthier planet need to continue. So um, I think there's things that have been put on pause for good reason. Obviously, one thing is the way that we're serving our food. We're packaging our food in order to have minimal contact with um, adults and people in general because of the virus being spread through respiratory droplets. And as a result, we want to make sure that we're packaging things so that people don't have any opportunity for exposure. So public safety has to take the priority right now. When we go back to normal service, as I was mentioning before, the hope is we pick up on things where we're going to learn where does it make sense to package and where does it not make sense to package? How can we do things to bring back the salad bars and self-service as an example? We know that the benefits in nutrition are going to be great by having access to fresh fruits and vegetables on our salad bars and to have students self-select those items instead of them being packaged behind plastic. Um, but it's going to be, I think, a pretty steep climb for us to instill confidence in the public that it's safe to take from a self-service salad bar again, and that there are sneeze guards and things that are going to prevent droplets from hitting the food, but we got to get back to a place where we're comfortable with that again. So that's Absolutely. one example. Another example is we do more service. So maybe there's going to be an opportunity to do more food service in the classroom and not wait for students to walk five flights down to the cafeteria to get their meal. But we want to make sure that we're giving them a really good meal in the classroom so that they can keep going with their day. So I think there's going to be a lot of push and pull. I think it's a very good question. Uh, I think it's a little bit too early to tell. But I would encourage you to stay engaged in these conversations because we're going to be redefining what the new future is going to look like. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Stephen. And I think you really put an emphasis there on the need to adapt and keep an open mind and how the time we're in now is there's no like flipping a switch and going back to what normal was in the past. It's redefining what a new normal is and moving forward. And so uh, we look forward to seeing how OFNS adapts and how our office can support you as a sustainability partner. But we're just so delightful to have you here today. I know it's been eye-opening for everyone. And um, I'm going to use the cheesy pun. You've given us a lot of food for thought, which is entirely true, um, and really helped explain uh, in a new way 
breaking down the different components of everything that your office deals with and thinks about um, across the spectrum of the economy, health, wellness, and sustainability. And um, we're just thankful for that and glad to have this conversation. So thank you for giving us your time. Um, Pat, can you advance to the next slide? We will be back here next month, continuing our series of Meet the Experts on April 29th. Um, excited for our next one too, just as Stephen uh, gave us a lot to think about. I believe Sandra Goldmark will as well. Sandra is an author of a new book called Fixation. Um, and she's also the Director of Sustainability at Barnard College. So we'll be having a conversation with her about introducing a fourth R, we all know reduce, reuse, recycle, Next week or next month, we're going to talk about repair and the importance of uh, repairing objects in our everyday life and how that can play a big role in our um, answer to consumerism. So we're looking forward to that um, and having Sandra with us. And then as a follow up from today, um, actually, I think there's a couple more events I want to talk about too. Pat, if you could advance, please. Um, yes. So. We have a lot going on in April. April is, of course, everyone knows Earth Week, Earth Month. Um, it's probably our busiest time as an office, rightfully so. I want to plug some great opportunities, uh, especially for uh, teachers with professional learnings. We will be concluding our Green Team series on April 14th. We know many of you uh, have joined us for the three. If you haven't made one yet, you can come to the fourth one. They uh, don't necessarily all build. There's some of it does, but it's not essential. So if you've missed out, come and join us for the final Green Team Series meeting. We have a professional learning on the climate crisis. Uh, this was rescheduled. It was supposed to be last week, but we rescheduled it because of the Chancellor's Address on April 15th. Um, a great opportunity to come and learn about how to teach climate education. We're having three presentations by DOE teachers that are part of our uh, DOE climate education leadership team. So we'll be hearing directly from educators about how they're teaching climate. So you can get the hands-on ideas and experience. And then, of course, our climate, um, or I'm sorry, not our climate, our Earth Week activities. Uh, every day during Earth Week, which begins on Monday, April 19th, we have a different uh, themed activity um, with a partner that we work with in our office uh, along different themes. So Monday, green space, Tuesday, water, Wednesday, waste, Thursday, climate, and Friday is, I uh, believe, energy. I can't see the screen. Yes, energy. So. Our Eventbrite is there. Register for any and all of those. The registration for this, this will be opening up next Monday um, very soon. So um, please make a note of that now as you're thinking about your Earth Day plans. And all of these events I just mentioned will be held in the afternoon starting at 3.30. And finally, uh, as a follow-up from today, Pat, if you could advance, please. Um, want to um, just let you know, thank you for coming. This was recorded. It, it'll, it will live on our YouTube page, but we'll send out a follow-up email uh, so you can have access to that link. Um, and we just hope that you will also join us in the future. And again, uh, really grateful to have Stephen here today. Um, I think we all have had a little bit of technology hiccups, but we have persevered. Uh, 12 months into COVID, we have learned how to adapt. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Yep. And appreciate everyone for joining us, and we'll see you next time.